in order mm-hmm. to be accountable, you have to walk around with the truth that you have taken a life. I have taken a life. It was the, the most devastating thing I could do in this world is take someone's son from them, take someone's brother from them, you know. It's something I gotta live with for the rest of my life. It's something I walk into the room with in every room I walk into. It's irreversible. It's final. This episode of What's Underneath Masculinity is made possible with the support of BetterHelp. If you want to start therapy, give BetterHelp a try and head to betterhelp.com slash what's underneath for 10% off your first month. So can you just begin by talking about uh, how you're feeling right now? I am nervous and anxious. I believe this is like my first interview too. Ever? Yeah, in freedom. I've never had this like happen, so. Well, that's an Thank you. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what your style says about you? I am really discovering my style right now. Because I was sentenced to 40 years to life when I was 15. I was incarcerated in, from juvenile hall to youth authority to state prison. Not only are you bound physically, um, you're bound even in your expression. So to wear sweatpants and tube socks and t-shirts and elastic band, waistband pants that says prisoner down the side of it or prisoner on the back of your mm. shirt, it's dehumanizing. Mm. It says that none of you guys are people. You have no right to express that you are a person. That's just how they see me. That's not who I am but they intend to use that word to separate me from you. When you're going through oppression, you can either accept that, they, that you are what they say you are. Like, you are a monster, you are unworthy. You can accept that and, and live like that, and people do. Or you can acknowledge who you truly are. I went into prison as a child. My history of style is like with baggy clothes. I grew up in like the early 2000s. So it was always, you know, fat form, Ava racks, like big baggy jeans. When I came home, I realized that I was a, like an actual man, like in my body. The space that my body takes up is different. It's kind of like why I was wearing slimmer clothes too, just trying to be smaller because I was trying to like match how I felt a little. You know, when you call the prisoner over and over and over and over, some of it like sinks in. It does affect your self-esteem, how much space you're worthy of taking up, you know? I think now I'm a bit different. I'm like willing to take up a little bit more space because I feel equal. I think my style might speak to that. Um, So I'm just like trying to work my way toward it and like just get comfortable. I think my style just says that I'm like searching for it. Can you talk a little bit about the assumptions that people make about you when they first hear the idea that you committed murder? When they find out how young I was, they will assume it was an accident. That's the assumption that I wasn't um, committed to toxic ways of being. Another assumption I think people make is the opposite, which is that I am a monster. I should be demonized. I don't deserve to be here. It doesn't make you feel like good when they assume that it was a mistake or no, like accident. no, it's not who I am to live in a, a false narrative that it wasn't um, as serious as it was. It, it doesn't benefit me. It doesn't benefit the family of the the young man who I murdered. It doesn't benefit my community to just it keep it in the binary where it's either you're a monster or you you've done something on accident, as if there's no middle ground. Can you take us back to when you were 15 and what happened? When I was a kid, when I was around like 11 or 12, my parents divorced. I grew up in a very like Christian household, very like traditional. And when my parents divorced, it really fractured my identity and validation from like street and gang culture was made available to me. And 
I dove in head first. I have family members like aunts and uncles who are gang members and grew up in gang culture, so I, I was raised in it. My brother uh, was, was from a, a different gang, and he was incarcerated for about four and a half years. By the time I was 15 years old, I was in a gang and had access to guns. And one night I, I shot somebody at a party. We had an altercation where we threatened one another. And me feeling like this is my hood, this is my territory, you can't talk to me like that. I'm offended, I'm insulted. And in gang culture, I'm well within my rights to act violently. I decided to escalate it because I believe that whoever is the most violent is the most dominant. Whoever is the most dominant has the most value. I left and got a gun from one of my homies, came back and I shot him. Right after I shot him, I ran. I ran because of the potential for somebody that he with to shoot. I ran because that's what I saw in movies. You shoot and you run. I saw the helicopter. I saw the police cars going by and I walked around my neighborhood for about 30 to 40 minutes before I arrived at a friend's house. And that's when I realized I wasn't gonna receive the praise that I thought I was gonna get. After I committed murder, I thought I was gonna be like celebrated by my homies. I thought I was gonna have some sort of status and notoriety. Um, and it didn't come. A lot of my friends were my age and they were afraid. Like, what did you do? What are you thinking? I was confused by people's reaction to what I thought was like something I was supposed to do as a gang member, something I was supposed to do as a man or a boy. At that time, um, more and more of my friends and more and more of the kids I knew had guns. At that time, I'm like heavily influenced by like the music I'm listening to. The, the songs that I'm singing at that time is chanting violence. It convinced me that it was okay to take a life, that it was as simple as said in a song. So some days later, I, I told my parents because I was scared. I was scared of retaliation. I was scared of the police. My father is a man of integrity. He taught me to not live the life I was living. So did my mother. When I told my parents the sadness, the sadness in their face, not the disappointment, not the anger which would come later, the sadness for what has happened, like they lost someone. It may have been in part for me, of course, I'm their child, but I knew also it was for the life of this young man. Yeah, okay. He comes from a family. Mm -hmm. Can you get the tissues? Thank you. I wasn't incarcerated until um, about a month later. Three days after I commit murder, my brother is murdered in a separate incident. This, this moment, where my family is experiencing such a loss and, and their child has taken such a great thing, such a big thing, a life. It made it real for me. And, and, and understand too that when I say the, the, it made it real for me, I don't mean fully. I just mean that I took note that something big has happened because of what I've done. Nobody's really explaining to me um, what it means to take a life. Nobody is really explaining to me the value of life. And I didn't know how his life is attached to mine. Mm -hmm. His life is attached to others. Mm -hmm. How do you feel talking about all of this? Is it something that's like hard for you to do or? I'm just thinking about his family, for real. Mm -hmm. And like them hearing this story. I don't want to hurt, mm. hurt them by telling the story. Mm. But I also um, want people to understand what goes on in, a, in the mind of a kid who, who is capable of committing murder, mm -hmm. taking a life. This watch is 
It's a Bova. Um, this watch is my, my dad's watch. I think my dad has found a way to uh, perfectly love me. Like my dad uh, is open to who I am as a person, fully. He has his um, understandings of the world. He has his own perspective and he offers them to me, not as a, a means of necessarily forcing it. I think early on he was trying to force me into his way of thinking. Um, and then he started to just let me be a person and has just been open with me and, and supported me through um, my incarceration in a way that is unique to him and, and means and has meant so much to me. We know you're really gripped by the story you're hearing, but we just wanted to interrupt this episode very quickly to tell you a little bit about our incredible sponsor, BetterHelp. So we both absolutely love therapy. We're actually obsessed with therapy. We're obsessed with therapy. It's pretty much all we talk about. It's all we talk about. Literally. <laughs> therapy helps you to see yourself and to reparent yourself. Whatever you didn't get, you can give to yourself. I think it should almost be a requirement. I mean, why do we brush our teeth? Why, why do, do we, we go why to the do, gym? Why do we learn math? I don't know, like, uh, and, not, and not understand who we are. I feel like we'd have a very different world if everyone was in therapy. And thanks to BetterHelp, it is available to everyone at affordable rates. BetterHelp is entirely online and it's designed to be very convenient and flexible to suit your schedule. All you have to do is just fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll be matched with a licensed therapist that meets your needs. And if for any reason you're not satisfied or you wanna switch therapists, you can do so for no extra charge at any time. Visit betterhelp.com slash what's underneath for 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash what's underneath for 10% off your first month. And now back to the episode. So can you take us like a little bit on the journey from kind of not realizing what you had done this to like really letting yourself take it in and kind of starting to maybe feel kind of accountable? I don't know if that would be the word that you would use. Yeah, like, so I was um, 18 years old on a level four maximum security prison. And during that time, it was so dark because the severity of taking a life um, was weighing heavy. I began to like hate myself for what I had done. We were on a lockdown. When you're on lockdown in prison, of course, no one comes out. So I'm in the cell by myself on this lockdown. And I like concluded that I could not live with myself anymore. Um, I could not live with this regret. I could not live with this shame. I felt like I was a burden to my, my family because they are now forced to take care of me while I'm in prison. At this time, I'm, I'm serving a 40 years to life plus life sentence. Meaning you think you're going to be there forever. I'm going to die here. Yeah. I'm going to die in this box. And I couldn't live with that. I was like, the family that survives uh, this trauma that I've caused is happier if I die. And I was suicidal. And that day, I was sitting on my toilet and I had a sheet in my hand and I was trying to figure out where I was gonna hang myself from our light or from my bunk. And truly a miracle, um, a friend of mine, he sees me through the window and he gets the tower to open the cell. He like taps the top of my cell door, open 118. And the tower does um, open the door and he hugs me. And he says, don't you ever let them get you here. He knew I was ready to go. And he demanded that I fight. Don't give up. I decided that if I was gonna live, I was gonna try to like transform myself. How did, how did you start to transform? I think honestly, releasing shame is the first stage for me. Shame doesn't help me be accountable in the way that I wanna be accountable. Shame, like, makes it about me. Like, I did this thing and therefore I am worthless. Therefore I am a bad person and therefore I am all these negative things. It like says the accountable thing and then goes right back to you. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to feel bad about myself, but I also didn't want to minimize what I had done. So um, how do you do that? And I think the way that I found to do that 
was to say what happened, period. Like, I wanted to be restored to my family. I wanted to be restored to community. I wanted to be restored to the value that I thought I had lost, that being in prison told me I had lost, right? And in order to be restored, you have to believe that you are worthy of being restored. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, you have to love yourself. Many um, formerly incarcerated people have struggled to accept being restored when there's so much telling them to still be ashamed about. Can you take off your jacket, finally? Yeah. Shout out to the jacket, it's gonna hold me down. <laughs> And so I finished up school, got my GED, and I started taking like self-help classes that incarcerated people were starting. All the while, like I'm, I'm, I'm writing, you know, I'm, I'm discovering that I, I, I like art, I like music. So along the journey of transformation and restoration, like in prison, like how did you start to like really own, like I did this? Well. I, I, in prison, sometimes people ask you what you're in prison for. And um, I found it as an opportunity to not make it a superficial conversation, mm -hmm. but to always talk about it in as open and honest a way as I could, where even the person, if they've committed the same act, they can see like how I'm talking about it and how mm -hmm. it's not rooted in shame, mm -hmm. um, but it's also not rooted in glorifying mm -hmm. my behavior. Um, for me, forgiving myself is acknowledging that I can never pay back what I owe. Mm -hmm. No amount of prison sentence is going to pay back what I owe. No amount of taking my life or like it's going to pay back what I owe. Not only can I not pay that back, I have to forgive it. I have to absolve the debt and from that clean slate now be who I want to be. Was there something that sparked the forgiveness of self? I met people while incarcerated who have harmed people close to me. And in wanting my own restoration and in wanting my own solidified worthiness, I had to see it in other people. If I wanted it for myself, then it must be true for you. And I found that in, in, in friendships and relationships that I made, even with people who have done me harm and done people that I love harm. While inside, I helped organize around passing laws that gave opportunities to earn time off your sentence. The law stated that they had to show that I would be a threat, a current threat, to community and public safety. And of course they can't, because I'm not. <laughs> and that just worked out. And I was, I had my case transferred back to the Juvenile Justice Department. And because I was 33 at the time, I was beyond the jurisdiction of the juvenile courts, and they released me. I was ordered release at 10.20 on June 10th, and I was outside of prison gates by 10.40, June 10th. Oh my God. What year? Uh, last year, 2022. It's only been about a year, right? Year and a half? Year and a half. Still fresh. Wow. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like. Dream. Unreal. I was standing in the parking lot of, I was waiting um, for my family, and I'm standing downwind of a tree, and I can smell it. And I just cry. There are no trees in prison. So for me, what it was like coming home was like smelling a tree and remembering that trees exist for real, not just on TV, not just in a book. So everything I do is like the first time I'm ever doing it. My first time on a plane flying to Jersey to meet my in-laws. And I remember like walking through the airport, I got my bags, I'm feeling like, you know, making my way downtown. <laughs> Feels so good, you know, dragging my, my bag. Did you meet your partner while you were inside? Yes, I met my wife um, when I was incarcerated. She really brought home the conversation around worthiness for me. Um, she invites me to like discover myself without like feeling ashamed of what I discover and feeling empowered to do something about what I discover and shape who I am. 
We got married November 19th, 2021. So while you were in prison? While I was incarcerated, yeah. We got married during the pandemic. When do you feel the most beautiful and or handsome? Honestly, often. Um, I love myself. Something about growing up like in a confined space, you come to intimately know yourself. And so I, I, I like what I see. I know I look like my father and I know people find my dad to be attractive, so I like that. Mm -hmm. Prison um, can invite you to feel like death is imminent, that your existence is at stake every time you wake up. I think it's because of that why I um, value my life. I only know, personally, only know my existence in this, this form right now. I wanna think about how I appreciate it, how I use it to, to help my life or help other people's lives. Are you equally comfortable being called beautiful or handsome? If someone calls you handsome, I think they mean to express it in a very masculine form, like you are beautiful in a masculine way. But when people tell me, Eddie, you are beautiful, I think they can mean two things, that they mean me as a person in my spirit. And I think they mean my physicality and they want to express that in a more gentle um, way. You have such like a gentle, soft, like energy. Can you relate or connect to the person at 15 that like did that? When I was a younger boy and a young man, a younger man, a lot of times I felt like hardness is the only way to be. That toughness is the only way I can present myself. So to, to, to present softer and, and calmer and, and was not acceptable in my mind, in my brain, it was not something I was allowed to do. Culture had not given me permission to do that. So I think in that sense, I know my 15-year-old way of being. I relate to it. It's a part of me. It's a part of who I am even now. It's just not wrapped in the toxic clothing that it once came in. What is your wildest dream? My wildest dream is that young people will find true value in my life story. That I don't go down in history as someone who just murdered somebody. But that from my life, from my story, someone else's life was changed and impacted. That my story contributes to someone's prosperity. That it contributes to my own. That is truly my wildest dream. That it doesn't just stop with what the court reported but that a seed can be planted or grow from it. What does it mean to you to be man enough? If I were to redefine it for myself, being a man looks like having integrity, keeping my word, living out what I believe, and doing so in a way that isn't harmful to others. Being a man looks like honoring my top five. Um, my top five is a list of uh, most important values, goals, and, and or people. And I make this list often. I redo it all the time. What's your top five right now? My top five right now is to honor God, Indigo Mateo, who's my wife. Um, and right now, it's really has changed to like finding my style for real. I'm not gonna cap. <laughs> my style and my sound. Um, finding my voice in prison was like finding my identity, finding my artistic voice, I mean. That feels very important to me. And a part of that feels like how I express myself outwardly in my fashion too. To, to express the worthiness that I was just speaking about. The worthiness that doesn't come with having a prisoner down your leg. <laughs>